See brown in your face. Have you heard of everything at once? Do you know about everything at once? It's internationally known. Aliens listen to it. It's the best. <laughs> if there's everything. something you're looking for in the 814, or feeling a little bored and think there ain't no more, no check more. out everything at once and allow it to be your source. It's that raw podcast that's always showing support, highlighting the scene. No need to take I-90 to peep or 79 to see how it be. Interviewing your locals with mindsets that are global. Innovators and creators on every single upload. So much going on in the EPA. Everything at once will keep you up today. Amazing guests. What you doing? Come through and hang with Tony and Dave. Community driven. Bringing everything at once from around the way. Everything at once from around the way. Hey. Please listen. We love you. <laughs> everything at once. Everything at once. Hello again, all you intergalactic listeners. We would like to start today's broadcast with a special thanks to all of our Patreon producers. Brian G, Josh W, E and D, Nick G, and Sadie M. Patreon is an awesome way to support this show and say thanks. You can become a Patreon supporter by clicking the link below and choosing to be an intern, assistant, or producer level supporter. And when we hit 10 Patreon supporters, Dave is going to perform an incredible feat that is yet to be determined. Hopefully it's something good. (laughs) We also want to thank all the local businesses and sponsors that supported this episode. These businesses get the everything at once stamp of approval. We couldn't do without them. And for those of you who have not heard, there are some interesting changes going on at Cauldron and Thorn. Yeah, what's going on there? Two years ago, America's first family of darkness landed in Erie, Pennsylvania. In a few short months, they built the world's largest shop, dedicated to the magical arts and metaphysical sciences. This summer, they invite you to explore the shadows of the human experience, a carefully curated catalog of arcane artifacts, and occult ephemera for the discerning collector. Cauldron and Thorn proudly presents The Dark Curiosities of the Vault. Well, Dave... They invited me back, and I checked it out, and I've got to say there is some incredible, extraordinary, paranormal stuff back there that's really just, uh, it's it really takes it to the next level. They're going above and beyond what they're used to out there. You always get all the all the sneak peeks. <laughs> Damn it. But you know what? I'm next su- time. Uh, next time, indeed. I'm super pumped, though. Is there anything else you can say about it? Well, not a whole lot right now. You're just going to have to go back there and check it out yourself uh, when the vault is finally open. And uh, I will be going there. We'll be going to uh, Cauldron and Thorn, which is located at 2724 West 8th Street. Um, I'll be going there in person to see what's in that vault since you already got that sneak peek, you bastard. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, I guess we should just get back to promoting uh, the sponsors. Yeah, let's get back to promoting the sponsors. Solid State. Solid State takes pride in all home remodeling projects. Solid State specializes in bathroom remodeling, kitchen renovations, windows and door installation, custom design work, and more, including painting, flooring, drywall, siding, decks. Get your free quote today by calling Nick at 814-397-7854. Solid Solid people, people, solid solid product, product, Solid State State Construction. Construction. Got a problem with your car? Tommy's Automotive can take care of everything car related. Tommy's Automotive is a reliable, trustworthy service provider. That's right. Tommy's Automotive can take care of brakes, exhaust, fluid changes, spark plugs, and all other maintenance needs. Tommy's Automotive also does fluid film undercoating to keep your car from getting eaten alive this winter by rust. Book your appointment today. Call Tommy at 814-384-8088. And now... What you've all been waiting for, our next guest, Carolina Cruz, author of Forgotten Lyric, now in the studio with us. Her book came out last Monday. We got the advanced screener copy, and we got to read it and sit down and hang out with her for a little while for this show. She's super awesome. She's a very talented writer. We got to really dig into the characters and the uh, plot, not so much the plot on the show because we didn't want to give too much up. Uh, not really any spoilers because we're fantastic at what we do. Pros. And uh, so is she. So um, we hope you enjoy the book. You better go out and get it and uh, enjoy the show. That's right. And now, Carolina Cruz. 
Speaking of foreign nations. Speaking of foreign nations. Oh. Uh-oh. We have a whole new foreign nation. We do. We have a new continent. Whole new continent yeah. to explore in your latest book. The Forgotten Lyric. The Forgotten Do-do-do. Lyric. Second of three. Um, and this is a risk I knew I was taking. And a reviewer recently pointed out was a risk. Um, I, yeah, I completely changed the cast in country. We're exploring a new part of the world. Um, it's completely, it's across a sea. So mm-hmm. they have very little connection to the last continent that we were on but a lot of they stuff do have traces there. though yeah they do. i love that i love it so much um the, there are little pieces from the other continent that make their way over to this new continent to remind us that it still exists and that it's still the same area or the same world it reminds me more of like a an MCU type thing instead of a uh, a direct sequel that you would expect i am i have been a comics comic book fan for a very long time so that's kind of yeah people are like oh i've never my mom actually i don't know i shouldn't say people it was my mom um <laughs> my mom was like wow this is crazy this has never been done before you're so innovative and i'm like i don't think that's true <laughs> <laughs> i'll take the compliment though yeah exactly yeah no i um i was gonna have the first one be a standalone um and then i as soon as I published the first one, I had like all this lore that I was like, I'll never get to write this into a book. The big plot twist in this one, I have had planned since book one. And I was like, but there's really realistically no way to incorporate it. It was what I thought. Mm -hmm. Um, And then certain characters kind of came into focus and I was like, oh, oh, if I don't make it like the main focus of the second book, there's actually a lot of ways that I might be able to to actually finally include and reveal that. So I was I was like, okay, we'll play with it. We won't announce it right away. We'll we'll like see, we'll like write the plot out and we'll see if there's something here. Mm-hmm. And by the time I was done with part one, I had the building blocks of something that I was like, this might need to be a trilogy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean it connects together really great in the end and uh I knew that it was going to connect eventually cuz I mean it's a trilogy, it's a second part of the book. So I knew that somehow um the old characters that we love like Marlo and Quincy and stuff from the other book would have to be drawn into this world at some point, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And maybe my own personal thing, but they are drawn in um I would like to see more of them, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to write more of them. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I really... One thing that I was started to be worried about early on was that... Um, because I really love Quincy and Marlowe mm-hmm. very, very much. I even managed to sneak in a short story at the end of this that has more of them um, and closes up some loose ends and open wounds from the first book. But... Um, I started writing Kenneth, the main point of view character for the first like third of this book. Mm-hmm. And um, as we get into like the end of the first part, um, he starts getting really angsty. Yeah. <laughs> um, he starts to things that he had been avoiding, things he'd been like trying to move past and heal from, he has to have those resurface and the emotions resurface with it. And at some point I was like, man, He's so pathetic. (laughs) Like, I say this with love. I love him so much. And I think the, like, pathetic parts of him are really important and part of why I love him. But I was like, what if people don't like him as much as they liked Quincy? What if, like, because we get into this, like, not that Quincy's not pathetic. She really is, especially early on. But, like, what if people don't want to see a pathetic character get better again what if they get tired of my shtick so um but by the time that i got into like the end of part two i was like people will like this guy i Mm -hmm. think so the book's been out has anybody finished the book yet i had a couple other advanced readers finish it um and i have had multiple people bring up a couple things um many people have brought up being nervous about the new cast so valid right understandable Um, and then a few people have mentioned that the writing is tighter on this one um which i appreciate because um i feel like i learned and improved a lot over the course of writing the second book i was aware of things that i wasn't aware of on my first one like 
repetitive sentence structure and like conversational like narration that was like kind of patchy on the first one I would go from like these like flowery descriptions to like Quincy's internal monologue being kind of very modern in tone so I still love that for Quincy I think it fits her story really well but this one's a lot more like consistent Mm -hmm. so yeah and this one it, there's a romantic interest in there. Yeah. And there's not really some, I mean, you kind of see it a little bit in the first one. It plays a little bit apart, or you might think that it might flourish into something, but this one is very much a, intentional. a love story, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. That was the um, kind of core going into this one was that I wanted to, I wanted this romance to work. And that was another thing I was nervous about. I've never written a romance intentionally. All the romances I've written, I've kind of just left characters open to it. Mm -hmm. I've been like, if characters have chemistry, they can get together, you know? But um, I was worried about two things. I was worried that Kenneth and Asa Um, the secondary main character, I was worried that the two of them wouldn't have chemistry. Like I'd get into it and there just would be nothing there and I'd have to like scrap everything. And then the other thing was I was worried that they were moving too fast because what ends up happening is the opposite of my first worry was they hit it off right away. Mm -hmm. Like from the first scene, Kenneth's like, wow, this person's hot. And I'm like, hey, calm down, buddy. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, It was definitely one of those moments where I felt like I lost control of my character because I wanted it to be a bit of a slower burn but we see when we get to ace's point of view that they've they take a, a little longer to yeah. warm up to it it definitely progresses and develops throughout the story and i feel like that also kind of plays itself to like the human experience you know a lot of the times you have that very immediate attraction from one party and another party that you know you have to kind of grow on a little yeah. bit you know what i mean yeah yeah and uh, I personally like that and appreciate that. And because, I mean, just to to me, a lot of times a relationship is work and it does develop over time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it, sometimes it's not really easy to see the qualities that we like in a person upon first glance. Yeah. Or to acknowledge that, um, that we're ready for commitment, which is something that Asa struggles with a lot is like, yeah, I like this person. Do do I really like them that much? Like, is this something I'd be willing to work on? Because I like, you can know that something's going to be a lot of work and that can put you off of it. But that also makes for interesting, an interesting story, because that means even after the characters get together, you still have story to tell because in the past, when I've written any romantic relationships, once the characters get together, it's like, well, now what? Yeah, It's like we've had the big moment, we've had the first kiss, and it almost feels like that story is over Mm -hmm. once the characters get together. But I feel like with Kenneth and Asa, there's a lot that I can still do with them that I'm really excited to do with them. Yeah, there's still definitely room to develop. And when me and Dave were reading this book and we were talking about it and discussing it, we kind of both had different impressions of... um, Asa Mm -hmm. and uh, I just wasn't sure if you wanted me to say it or not, but it, it, we we both had different impressions of Asa and we both had different impressions of multiple characters throughout this. And we kind of thought it was very interesting that um, these characters kind of take on their own life for each person that reads them. And I don't know if that's intentional, but like also, I mean, you have your drawings of the characters, but if you don't look at those drawings or know those drawings you know asa or kennett or anybody else can kind of look um you know how you imagine them in your mind yeah yeah there's not like a lot of description like oh he has a you know right prominent cheekbones and a sharp chin or like you know what i mean yeah full lips or anything like that it's very much left to the reader's design to create that character yeah i try to keep it pretty loose with descriptions because um there are a few things that are important to know about the characters, and those are the things that I reiterate. Like, it has a gap between their teeth. Um, they have darker skin. They have curly hair. Um, they wear gold and orange. Um, and Kenneth, we know that his hair is graying, and we know that he's got a lot of scars and that he looks very tired. Um, <laughs> and, like, those are the important things. But honestly, um, in the past, I don't know if I talked about this the first podcast, in the past, I have um, asked friends of mine who are artists to draw my characters 
without looking at my references and been like, however you imagine them, mm -hmm. go for it. Um, and one of my friends, Drew Quincy, um, coming off of Profit, he really liked her. And he changed how I saw her in my head. It, his drawing was like, I looked at it and I'm like, that's her, that's Quincy. Um, I had been, I always do this. I start to gravitate as I draw Quincy more and more. I make her more and more buff. Um, <laughs> but he like pulled her back down to being more like scrawny and wiry. And he gave her this like shade, straight shaggy hair and um, this very like gaunt face. And I'm like, wow, it completely changed how I started drawing her. So I love seeing how other people interpret the characters because I've said this before, the art that I do of my characters is more or less like my fan art of mm -hmm. them. It's my interpretation of these characters, but I don't feel like my interpretation of them visually is any more valid than anyone else's. I'm still learning how to draw them. I, I think it's so interesting that, um, well, I guess you, you like asked your friends to, to do it. I think it's so interesting though that uh, you appreciate the art base of of how people see it because it, it reminds me of like the book movie thing like people say like the movie's never as good as the book and the movie's never as good as the book because you have this grandiose image of like exactly what you think it's gonna be and i can think of multiple movies like like i've never watched a i've watched maybe a couple minutes of the harry potter movies you know but i read the books and i was like these are pretty you know enjoyable i read them as a kid and it happens over and over again. I just think it's interesting that you like the interpretations that aren't your own. Yeah, I don't know why. Like, the, I guess it comes from like drawing fan art of a bunch of characters myself and having my own version of, of book characters that I've always liked to, to draw. I was part of a very small fandom for a book series called Beyonders, which is a young adult fantasy series. And there was a character that we all really loved whose name was Farron great character, very like weedily, like, is he going to betray them or not type? Love that. Um, but we all, as a fandom of like maybe a few hundred people tops, hated the official art. We all decided we don't know what Farron looks like, but it's not that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everyone immediately had their own interpretations. And I have never seen anyone be like, oh, no, that's not right. Oh, no, that's not right. Everyone was like, all we know is that he wears an eye patch. He has chest hair. He's short. That's literally the only descriptions that we get in the book. Hmm. Um, and as long as the drawings had those three things, everyone's like, we love this guy. Right. It didn't matter. Like, you give him pointy ears. You give him a beard. You give him, like, a big hat. doesn't matter. Everyone's like, this is, that's the guy. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that that kind of influenced how open I am to interpretations of my characters. Cause it's like, that's just, it's really cool to see how we, I think it goes in line with the themes of these books is like how we as humans, um, interpret each other. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's really interesting too, because it feels like a lot more communal too, when everybody can kind of share their own idea and get feedback and inter interpretation on it rather than it being yours. You know what I mean? Like taking ownership and being like, this is my character. This is what they look like. This is who they are. This is uh, set in stone. Whereas you leave it open to interpretation and have some ambiguity involved in deciding what this character looks like to you, what this character means to you. And uh, I think that's really interesting and creative and it kind of feeds that communal spirit. You know what I mean? Because now people can talk about this kind of aspect instead of all having like this very certain image portrayed in their head. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there's only a few things that are like really, really important because they like play directly into the character's personality and stories. And I think if you removed those things, the story would not be the same. Mm -hmm. So in book one, Quincy is biracial. It's super important to me that that's like kept. No one should ever draw her as white. Um, no one should ever draw her. Well, I mean, it's hard to kind of separate um, when you're when you're drawing that kind of thing. But like mm -hmm. she having a name that's hard to pronounce, being um, kind of having traditions associated with both sides of her family is very important because I um, ha come from a family that's like Puerto Rican and um, Austrian-Ukrainian. And so I 
kind of put those experiences into Quincy, even though she comes from very different cultures from mine. And that's really important to her story and how she's treated and how she's accepted by the world. So if anyone wants to imagine her, it's important to me that they, that aspect is kept. Same thing with um, Asa having, you know, being black, having darker skin, curly hair, wearing the silk scarf um, when they sleep at night. Um, that's very, and obviously being non-binary, very important to me because that's important to how that character kind of navigates the world and how other people like people reading the book will perceive them so that's mm -hmm. that is that stuff is important but like the minutia of like how curly is their hair like how dark is their skin like what is whatever with that i'm never gonna like i'm never gonna police someone who draws them like that i i think like the other the only other um or maybe the only descriptors that pop up over and over again in like the first and second book that i think is interesting are, are the scars mm -hmm. yeah yeah those are like like you were saying they're they're things that like you can't not imagine the person without the scars right. that they have very important to their history and who they are as a person yeah and and i think that's really interesting that you can identify these certain physical characteristics that tie into their uh you know human experience you know what i mean because there are certain things that physically change in a per that can be different in a person that will lead to a different type of experience navigating through the world and the so and society and socially and all these other things that kind of tie into those those actual experiences that they have yeah and leaving it open the rest open for interpretation is you know good and interesting because it lets it lets us see how things are different Mm -hmm. from different perspectives and despite like having these telltale characteristics that add into some part of their experience as a human being there's still so much that like doesn't particularly matter societally or socially mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly that's kind of also plays into why i made one decision with this book um early on when i was first writing the scene where Ace introduces themselves i texted one of my friends uh, a couple of my friends because this is my first time writing a main character who's non-binary. It's my first time ever reading a book Same. with a character that's non-binary. My main character, at least. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that was something that I knew I wanted to do. But immediately, because we've seen in this world before that um, briefly, briefly in profit, that homophobia is not a thing. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have that in this world. Um, I didn't want to write racism. I didn't want to write homophobia or sexism. So characters may have reasons to dislike each other. Usually that's because of status, lifestyle, um, like personality flaws. Like, um, But I didn't know because of that, because there's no homophobia, I didn't know if I wanted to write people asking for Ace's pronouns. You know, that was something that I am really glad you brought up because I thought about that a lot when I was reading it. Because it's my first time ever reading it and it's, I have not interacted with enough people that identify with they, them pronouns to be super comfortable mm -hmm. saying them or seeing them or reading them. I might misgender people based on whether how they present, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that's something that, you know, is just part of like growing up and developing and, right we um, all we all got like things that are it's new part of the learning curve time. yeah 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 absolutely um which is part of why even though i personally um am okay like i identify with both she her pronouns and they them pronouns um and i have for like a year or so been messing around with that more or less just testing some things out um but like even though i am writing from my own experience with asa um, I still reached out to a couple other friends who are non-binary and I was like, so how would you want to read this? Mm -hmm. Because I wrote the scene two ways. I wrote it with, um, when Asa introduces themselves, kind of asking for like, kind of asking for their pronouns, the other, both of them kind of the way that they was like, well, how should I refer to you? And then the answer would include pronouns instead of just a name. And then I realized a few things that I would not work about that are one that would have to happen every time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen people do it a few ways. I've seen people leave, have the other characters avoid pronouns, pronouns until they hear someone else use the pronouns, mm -hmm. um, the correct ones. But because Asa is a stranger to this country, 
there would be no one to start that chain. Um, mm-hmm. They'd have to start it themselves, and to have them referring to themselves in third person would be super awkward. Um, so what I eventually landed on was like, it's fantasy. Fuck it. Um, like, yeah, they'll just know. And that's your that's that's your decision, your yeah. creative license as an exactly. author. You know what I mean? I I've seen other people do it other ways. This was something there where I was like, personally, I kind of wish that people would look at me and not see like lady girly han sweetheart woman like at being a barista you get a lot of that all the time it's mm-hmm. like hey ladies when it's me and one of my like um barista friends who's also like femme presenting and it's like ooh, i don't like it very much and i wish that people could just look at me and be like this person does not want to be called ladies but mm-hmm. um people don't pick up on that and mm-hmm. i was like well i'm writing a fantasy the way in a i want Functionally, I'm writing a world that I would want to live in. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I'll, I thought, ju- I'll just do it. I, I thought it was, like, incredibly, um, like, if I was someone who picked up the book that was in that situation, it would be something that, even though it's obviously a fantasy book, it, it's kind of it would kind of bring hope a little bit because there's no, like, messy explanation of things. It's just, like, this is the character. Mm-hmm. This is how they are. Everybody... Just, just knows to do that because that was something that because like you said we're on a learning curve and tony and i were talking about it. it's like oh that's really interesting how there's no like conversation about you know get into the the they them pronouns but that, that could be like a, a very like inspirational or hope inspiring thing for someone reading it mm-hmm. i just thought it was really cool it was a nice touch to the book thanks yeah <laughs> i um It was interesting too. Another interesting thing that while me and Dave were talking about this is that Asa presented feminine to Dave and presented masculine to me. Mm -hmm. And there, I don't there. I mean, there are aspects of both that show up in the book. You know what I mean? He, they, excuse me. (laughs) You're good. They, uh, they, they do certain things that are, that would be considered feminine and they do certain things that would be more masculine as well. And it's not really one uh, you know, characterization or one definite thing that would say, oh, you know, this person is masculine or, oh, this person is feminine. You know, they are what they are and mm-hmm. it's a little bit of both, you know? Yeah, no, that's a hundred percent. Um, something that like, I, I mentioned this earlier, I didn't pick what we call an assigned gender at birth going in. Um, it's never occurred to me to honestly, like I've thought about like, oh, you know, if I were to draw them, what would I do? But every time it's, it's different. I've never settled on anything um, because I don't know. That's just who they are. That is, that is literally very much just who they are. I've never, I've, I, I don't, I can't really think of them as anything other than non-binary. Right. Um, and it makes yeah. sense in the end. It does, yeah. <laughs> yes, ha, 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 we've read it. You guys don't know. You, you will gotta read it. You gotta read it to find <laughs> out. Read it. These juicy little, These uh, little bits snippets. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But um, yeah, I have other people who have read it who also, um, when they if they slip up, because plenty of people have not. But um, if people slip up, it usually it goes one way or another, which is like really interesting to me to see how that happens, because obviously, like my preference would be that people just see them as asa but Mm -hmm. i do understand that like they are this is this is something like in certain circles that i'm in where i've i've written this book um and people read it they have surrounded themselves by enough queer people that like they they're like oh yeah ace is asa never misgender them fine but like there there's a lot of people in the world with a lot of different experiences and it's um unreasonable to expect everyone in the world to like get it right away especially because i know that (laughs) i know that a lot of people who read the first one were people who picked it up at ember and forge and um they have they don't know who i am um they don't know my background um they may be passing through on a trip or whatever excuse me um and it's like those people i'm really interested to see if the reception changes for this one because like again it's a lot of people's first time reading a non-binary main character um it might be a lot of people's first experience even interacting with a non-binary anything character mm-hmm. human being any of that stuff yeah yeah um yeah that's something that i would like i had a okay so i had a sensitivity reader for this one 
because Asa is black and I am not. Mm -hmm. And um, early on as I was writing, they were just Hispanic. Um, I did not have anything planned in that regard. But the more fantasy Hispanic, Mm -hmm. right? But the more that I drew them, I was like, this character is black. And I want that to be um, apparent in the way that I write them. I want that to not be up for interpretation. And I want it to be done sensitively. And that was... um, I knew that was going to be a lot of work, but I definitely wanted to do that. So I reached out to a um, someone who does sensitivity reading as their full time job. Um, her name is Ruthie. She's amazing. Oh, cool. um, yeah, she's super dope. But she she gave it a read. She reads a lot, mm-hmm. like so much, um, and she was super helpful in helping me like make sure that Asa was written well. But when we were having our consultation, she told me that this was the first time she's read a non-binary main character. And I'm like, blown away. That's interesting away. for a sensitivity Someone reader, who you, reads a lot, you'd yeah. You'd think that... It would come up. Well, mm-hmm. she sensitivity reads specifically for certain things that she has experience with, and she's not non-binary. Or right. I'm not sure about any other identifications, but I know that much. Mm-hmm. So she doesn't specifically sensitivity read for that, so it's not something that like she's seeking out. Or, right, or would come to her. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, yeah, I was surprised. I thought that she would have she would have come across that, but I was like super flattered and honored that I got to be, like, at the time just anyone's first experience with that and now i'm realizing that that's more uncommon than i was led to believe because i just run in enough online circles that are queer that i thought it was way more common than it actually is yeah i like how like the social commentary that you know comes up with this is is around like the non-binary or the lgbtq plus but unlike the first book like there was the social commentary too but it was very very much religion and it was very very much contentious in the book you know like right. yeah. very pointed like back and forth like and it still is to an extent in this book just not it's, it's not the it, primary focus right yeah, yeah right no go ahead sorry no but yeah but that was kind of my point though was like with the religion side of thing in the first book and it's in this one too but in the first one it was just like a very like pointed like back and forth like there was like a struggle over it and we can have the social commentary too in this book about about the uh the non-binary the lgbtq but it's not there's there's no struggle in the book the commentary no. is um these people exist exactly <laughs> which right. is which is dope and I, I like it that's what i'm getting at yeah is, thank right. you yeah it, it's interesting too that i think that hmm we can have a social like the social commentary changes and is constructive in different ways rather than just being pointed towards uh i don't know the negativity that's associated with religion and the openness that people are experiencing towards LGBT plus and non-binary people, you know, Mm -hmm. how we can still have that social commentary and we can have constructive talks about it where we, um, acknowledge and respect everybody and still, um, can change that idea or that identity that we're discussing. If that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. No. Um, that's something that like with this book specifically, um my hope is because it's the second book in a series um and i kind of i feel like i tricked people a little bit because the first book has one same-sex relationship it's in the very last like third of the book and it's side characters Mm -hmm. so you can totally miss it um and then this one everyone's queer yeah so it's so funny um i'm i'm expecting there to either be people who drop the series completely after this one. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, I'm really hoping that because the focus of the story is not on the social commentary of like coming out stories or asking for pronouns or like following a specific like experience that people associate Mm -hmm. with like queer narratives instead just being a really like interesting on its own fantasy story. The people who usually don't go for these types of characters will Mm -hmm. give these characters a chance and maybe that will open them up to more specifically like queer stories in the future because now they're like oh like this isn't something to be afraid of yeah and i think that's a lot of the complaint from 
people that are, uh, you know, not open-minded to this type of relationship or this type of commentary is like, oh, well, you know, maybe if they didn't just throw it in our face all the time, it wouldn't, you know, who cares? Go do your thing, but I don't want to hear about it. And in this book, it very much is not about the, um, you know, queer experience. It's just about living their life and being queer. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. That's what I really was going for because... I mean, that's, there's the, obviously a spectrum in real life of people who are activists, people who want to be heard and make a difference, um, and then people who really do just want to live normal lives. And both are valid and important experiences sure. for people of to course. live. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the stories that we tell. Yeah. And it, it, it's very, and it's important to, to have those ones that are specifically about the um, you know, the queer experience and coming out and integrating into society where it's not so accepted. And this one is almost like post, um, I, like po almost post identity, I would say, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I've been calling it or thinking of it to myself when this is no longer a thing, just like, uh, you know, we have post racism and post feminism where those issues are no longer needed to be advocated for because they just are accepted. So the way that we talk about it in the writing community, when we're talking about worlds like this, where there is not any, um, kind of prejudice, mm -hmm. especially towards LGBT, um, identities, um, the word is queer normative. Okay. So we real life live in a heteronormative society, sure. um, where the dynamics are very much based off of, um, straight kind of traditional, um, relationship dynamics. Um, in a queer normative setting, those are completely gone. And I really like that word because it can imply that like, oh, it's normal. Like the norm is now to be gay and being straight's abnormal, but really it's just that like everything is equal. Yeah. It's and all, it's just normal. Straight characters are straight. Gay characters are gay. We don't. It, yeah. It's just the uh, connotation that people put on the word. Mm-hmm. That, exactly that makes it to maybe some the people stigma. like a negative thing you mm -hmm. know yeah uh, but like the way that the that's why it's something that i only use in marketing online where because to queer people it's positive to say like oh, a queer normative setting everyone's like oh thank god finally mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. <laughs> um but in real life uh in real life there's a lot of people that wouldn't pick up your book because of that well i mean yeah. there's whole states that are banning these types of books in real life i just don't say anything yeah <laughs> right well that's the thing is the back of the book um this is something that i think will be funny the back of the book ace's pronouns are on there so i mean it, it doesn't say asa comma they them it's it just it the blurb they. just uses their pronouns mm -hmm. as you would um and obviously the book doesn't make a big deal of it i <sighs> I'm wondering a couple things. I'm wondering if there will be people who just like don't pick up on it. Like you think that you're going to have an issue. Oh, I don't understand they, them pronouns. And then like you get into it and you just don't pick up on it because they're used so naturally. I'm wondering if people are going to pick it up, not notice it on the back of the book, get into it and be like, what is going on? <laughs> I think that people will do that for sure. Oh, yeah. Because it was like at first it was very much a different experience reading it using they them pronouns throughout the whole thing especially mm -hmm. early on i'm like oh my like are there two and, people talking and right maybe now? that's yeah, my exactly. maybe that that probably is just like my own growth and my own experience moving through the different type of grammar that you're using in the different kinds of pronouns because at first mm -hmm. like every time it would pop up like my brain would you know flash or whatever right, yeah I'd exactly like, it's the old, and I have a you know a lot of experience with it. I went and getting the degree in English, but it's like the very old like from when I was growing up. Like the the plurals, you don't use the plurals, so that's what like for my right. brain no, was everyone, the most exactly. difficult. Well, in my head, it's like um, it's like they say about Shakespeare. You you start watching a Shakespeare play, you have no fucking clue what they're saying, and then your brain starts to get it. It at, at some point, it just like after after a certain amount of time, there's like a scientific study that they did. Your brain like gets it yeah. and starts understanding what's happening, and I, I think that's kind of what goes on with they them pronouns as right. well. I think after the first hundred pages, like it just, it normalized itself or integrated, mm -hmm. so, you know what I mean? But yeah. at first, yeah. especially the first like 10, 20, 30 pages that uh, have ASA in it, my brain was just like, wait, 
Wait, like, who, uh, what? Huh? <laughs> it's, not, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. This isn't following the normal patterns of speech that yep. I'm used to. Yep, yeah, 100%. But I think a lot of people will read the book and not expecting that and be uh, taking or have like a similar experience with those types of pronouns. Yeah, And I would not be surprised. I also don't want to... S- I mean, it's so... F- it's, it's shitty to say, but I'm sure some people will probably put it down because oh, yeah. of that. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, this is something that, like, I've just kind of come to accept. I was talking to my spouse about it pretty early on, and I was like, yeah, it, it's kind of stressful because, like, but I but then again, like, the first book is very critical of religion, and I kind of expected certain people to drop it because of that, and mm-hmm. a lot of people went through on it anyway, and so mostly... I'm not looking at it as every person who puts it down as a loss. I'm looking at it as every person who makes it through as a win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not even that they're a loss if they put it down, because I think that it's still good to see people, like, to let people know, like, hey, it's fucking out here, guys. Yeah, it's real. Like, (laughs) just to encounter it is so important. Um, And there are going to be people out there who pick it up who thought that they, they would never see that. In an, like in a sad way, like they're like, oh, I guess I'm just never gonna see a book with a non-binary main character, and right. maybe they'll pick it up and and be able to experience that. And either way, again, I know it, <laughs> that and the like, and the starting with a whole new cast on book two are both things where I was like, this is this is I, a risk. man, I'm doing this. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's the stories I wanted to tell. So it, it's a risk, and I think that when you try to write something that pleases everybody, you end up pleasing nobody. And it's better to have your market or to know who you're trying to speak to, who's going to buy and who's going to read your book and appreciate it and love it for what it is. And yeah, and everyone else, re- don't even worry about yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> reach to them, you know what I mean? Target your market and yeah, and enrich it, you know, enlighten it, vib- add that vibrance, add that character to it. Yeah. With how expansively you've gone into different directions with this book, not uh, just, just character-wise, with it just being totally different, you know, uh, setting, scenery, characters. I mean, I know it's a lot of work. These are these are long books, but like, can, can you really keep it at three? <laughs> Is so, it really a trilogy? Yeah, right. <laughs> the okay, so okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> right. So, so um, the trilogy itself is going to have the biggest overarching story because it's got a lot of stuff. Um, that that is really impactful on the world. Um, I currently have two short story anthologies planned. Um, one that follows characters before the trilogy, mm-hmm. and one that follows characters after the trilogy. Um, so when I say before the trilogy, I mean as far back as like the time of the gods that we learn about in this book, like way way far back. Um, there are certain characters that are alluded to in some of the lore, like world building sections of this book, that I'm like. I have short stories written about already, mm-hmm. um, which is, I mean, they came up because they were relevant, but they also came up because I love them. Um, and then characters afterward are as far in the future as like contemporary times in this world. Um, and then outside of that, I have a um, Southern Gothic horror that Ooh. I have planned. Ooh, that sounds I fun. Love that. Yeah, yeah. I no, love that. I'm really excited. It's set in the same world about 200 years in the future. Um, after the trilogy's over, after the characters have made their mark, we get to see how the kind of world developed after Quincy and her weird theology kind of blasted through the world and see how the religion developed because of her, how the world developed because of the characters that we see in Lyric, like all of this stuff, but we follow very like Southern Gothic, like cowboy characters. And I've got the whole thing plotted out already. It's it's ready to go, but I got to finish book three first because I don't know how Quincy will affect the world until I'm done with book three. And so I don't know for sure. It's like a mix of Star Wars and like where the crawdads sing. It's, yeah. Um, I think my main influences have been, there's this movie on... Netflix called Apostle. It's a horror movie. Um, it's really dark, and I love it very much. <laughs> and that one, that one, and Midnight Mass, which I think I talked about last time I was on the podcast, because it's like one of my favorite stories ever. Um, but those kind of like, yeah, Brother Crawdad sing, very like 
swampy rivers, like all this like kind of murky kind of setting. So again, very different from the trilogy. I'm very excited about it. It's going to be much shorter too, um, which is going to be nice for me. <laughs> yeah. You have to be busy writing. I mean, this is two books and how, how long since you started the first one? Uh, I started the first one in 2017, um, but that's because I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, so this one took me only two years start to finish. And then I have book three set to come out in 2025. Um, and that's giving myself more time than I need because <laughs> I'm already 65,000 words into book three, um, which is about halfway through, I would say about two thirds of the way through even. Um, I'm going to rewrite it, going to add more words because um, now that book two is out, I'm like weight off my shoulders. The yeah. creative juices are flowing again. There's a lot of stuff that needs retooled. But with book two, I didn't start writing it until book one was out. Mm -hmm. um, but, but with book three, I started writing it the moment that I finished drafting book two. I was like, I'm going to take a break from writing. I'm going to read something. I'm going to read Neil Gaiman's Sandman comics and like refresh myself here. And then I read volume one of Sandman. And I was like... <laughs> I, I need go. to get back to it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, my computer? I have to get back into it. Do you type all your stuff on a, on a laptop? I, uh, yeah, I have my, uh, I wrote my entire first book. Okay. So back in 2016 or 2015 during national novel writing month, I was writing this, um, kind of satirical, it was very boring. It was not very good. Mm -hmm. I was writing something and my computer crashed completely and I lost like three chapters of work. Um, so I've been writing in Google docs ever since. Um, and I have one laptop that I wrote all of profit on and then i'm now i'm at a, like my desktop in my office and i have my like setup i have all of my funko pops that watch over me Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um i have a custom funko pop of quincy that my one of my friends bought for me um and she stares at me the whole time that i'm writing and i'm like i'm i'm, I'm trying <laughs> i need to get more decorations for down here we need to. Is it is it a lot of pressure having Quincy stare at you? Uh, you better fucking get this she's right. She's all over the place. <laughs> I'm my own biggest fan, honestly. So I have I have the Funko Pop. I have stickers. I have a big poster on my wall that's like all of the characters from. I have two now. Mm -hmm. I have one for Lyric as well that I did, and then I have a print that's art that I got done of her. So I have like five different versions of Quincy like looking at me while I'm trying to write. That's funny. <laughs> it's a mo it's a good motivator. I mean, she's my buddy, so I'm not really that I couldn't um well I could imagine writing it on a laptop I'm sure tons of people do but I'm super picky about keyboards I feel like I would if I was writing as much as you were writing I would want like my special typing keyboard you that's know, like loud and clacky and mm -hmm, mechanical mm -hmm. you know what's really weird is I've been working on like a short story compilation lately and uh all on my phone in yeah. google docs but on my phone like I remember yeah. like uh on the road uh Jack Kerouac uh just one continuous scroll is how he wrote it. And I, I always liked that idea. Mm -hmm. And so just on the phone, it's just like, it's gone, you know, like it's, a yeah. little, you know, just keep on typing and plugging away. I've actually really liked it because it's, it's more, uh, mo obviously it's more mobile. It's a you can really, mobile like, phone. <laughs> you can go really intuitively, like as well. It's just as things occur to you. That's how I do my plot stuff is I have like, I have like three different notes apps that all have different versions of different notes. And um, I have Google Docs, obviously. So oftentimes when I'm, I get my best ideas when I'm driving and I'll like be on like a like brainstorm drive, I'll drive out to like Corey or somewhere and then turn around and come back. <laughs> um, and sometimes I'll have to like pull over and be like, oh my God, I gotta yeah. write this down. Cause I know that by the time I find like a McDonald's I'm, to park in, I'm gonna have forgotten all no of this. No text to speak? Uh, no, I, I'm really bad at, at that. I it frustrates me mm -hmm. so sure yeah, yeah. Me too i i don't know maybe i'm just a a, a finger per or a, i don't know i feel like i would get uh annoyed even when i try to type stuff on my phone for text messages i mess everything up and it's annoying i couldn't imagine like actually trying to write a short story on my phone dave i've, I've done a couple and it's very satisfying yeah yeah. yeah. Overall positive experience. Overall positive experience. The only other thing I won't make it about me, but the only other other thing I want to do before I die is to to do a whole story on a typewriter. Oh, me too. Oh my god, yeah. Are you kidding me? I would love that. I'd love to get my hands on a typewriter. I used to write when I was in high school. I used to write um, all of my stories handwritten in a notebook, and then I would get home, and I would 
have the notebook open on my lap and I would like be looking at the notebook and writing into like a document on the computer as I was like, and I would edit as I went. And that kind of went into my process with actually writing these books is when I'm done with my first draft, I take the first draft in one window on one monitor and then I have a blank document on the other and I will literally rewrite the entire thing um, and edit it as I, as I'm rewriting it. Hmm. Yeah. It was funny a long time ago when me and Dave were still in school. Well, I wasn't in or Dave wasn't in school yet, but I was in school and I asked for his help on one of the papers I was working on and I gave him the prompt and, uh, the, the stuff that the paper had to be written about. And we met up later that like later the week or whatever. And he had like four pages of handwritten <laughs> shit for me to like, look at. That's amazing. It was, it was, it was hilarious. I did like, so I had to like transcribe all of Dave's handwritten notes, not all of them, but, uh, maybe, maybe all of them, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I had to transcribe them onto my paper with, uh, with text and stuff because he wrote them all by hand on paper. Yeah. A million years ago. I used to love it. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm getting like like arthritis or something, but it's Mood. just like it hurts more it hurts. to write. So like that's I, if I could still write like that, I probably would. Yeah, yeah. that was like almost like ten years, like eight years ago, probably like seven time. years ago. Back when I was a, a spry young person. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> but, but I think that I feel like writing takes on so many different forms, and that there are different ways to do it, and each different way that you do it kind of lends its own different kind of experience you know yeah. what i mean as far as the writing goes it's the same thing with art um i have seen so many people it's all about how we learn how to do it because um for a long time i just didn't know that there were other ways to do writing or drawing i just knew what i had kind of figured out on my own sure uh, and then i would run into someone else who had learned a completely different way and like you know this whole time i've been doing three sketches and then doing really intricate line art. And then I see someone who does a sketch and then paints over it. I'm like, what? You can do that? Uh, it's the same thing with writing. Um, you gotta find what works for you. Uh, Cause some people will outline like very methodically, like bullet points. Some people do not do an outline at all. One of my friends, this guy that I know in the Netherlands writes fantasy as well. No world building document, no plot document, nothing. Just goes Just into it. Just rip. He's, yeah. And I have to sometimes because um, we do this thing where as we're writing our first drafts, we will read a couple chapters every week just to kind of give feedback and stuff. And sometimes I catch things that I remember reading that he completely forgot he said. I'll be mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You said this before. You, you said this before. And he's like, oh shit <laughs> i remember the way i used to write research papers in college was like just unconnected paragraphs and then i'd go back through and add the information in between the paragraphs that were my ideas like not bullet points like just the full like sometimes i wouldn't write the introduction till the end well you don't know what the whole story is like it's kind of like that with um writing books too is sometimes mm -hmm. you don't know what the thesis of your of your paper is until you're done writing it like mm -hmm. i would say i probably knew what profits themes were going in because i knew well no that's a lie i knew what profits themes were once i got about two-thirds of the way through the book i was like okay i know what i want to achieve with this and that kind of changed how i wrote the ending because i was like i have something i want to say now because when i first started i was like this is just a depressed little dolly that i'm like throwing into a ring um but by the time that i got to the end i was like i need her to get better because i want to get better um <gasps> <laughs> Oh, Quincy. Yeah. I was like, did yeah. you just misgender no, no, Asa? No, no, is that no. actually the secret? No, there is no there is no <laughs> secret. But wouldn't it be funny if I did that? Again, I, the only time that ever happened when I was writing was um, if they were in a conversation with someone else, sometimes they would accidentally adopt the pronouns of the other person in the conversation because I would just be so used to writing if they were talking with, like, Hannah. I'd be so used to writing she, 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 they, 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 eventually – it happened the the opposite direction a couple times too though it's not as bad as when i changed harriet's gender in the third draft and i, and I had like misgendered her like five times in the draft that my editor got they're mm -hmm. like hey did harriet used to be a man and i'm like why would you ask that <laughs> was it harry it was uh, no it was a completely different name it was georg i think it was another <laughs> one of those weird german names 
Nice. Yeah, I do love a weird German name here and there. Pour one out for Harriet. Pour one out for Harriet. God's God's (laughs) being good. Yeah, we'll miss you. (laughs) No, we won't. (laughs) Maybe not. Okay. Yeah, no, that's it's so funny to me um, that that's the last line of of this like written in this book is uh, by from any character is like (laughs) suck it, Harriet. (laughs) So, yeah. What was I gonna? What was I talking about though? We were Um, just talking about uh, like. writing processes right. yeah. yeah no um with, with and learning new techniques and themes. experiences themes yeah because with with book two themes were something that i also didn't know until part three i think part three is where a lot of the themes come full circle so mm-hmm. is there more pressure right in these books now that you've established a standard like and a following the, and a following <sighs> yes and no because on one hand um, I know that this book is technically better, like written better. Um, so there are certain people, there was this old guy that, that sounds so rude. There was this older gentleman who came into Ember and Forge and, um, never met me before, took a huge risk, bought, bought profit, um, left me really like left me a high rating on Goodreads, but he did come in and talk to me and I'm like, what did you think? Is there any, like anything that you would say? And he's like, He's like, I think it could stand to have maybe been proofread one more time. And I was like, ouch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like he came in today and I was like, I got it for you on Monday. And I'm like, I don't want, I don't mean to brag, but several people have told me the writing's better on this one. <laughs> um, so I'm excited for his feedback. Um, I think I'm mostly just like there, there's pressure and some days I get really, really stressed because I'm like, what if people hate the new cast? What if people hate that I've gone with a new cast? What if people don't like how much queerer this book is? What if people don't like how little focus there is on Gethinism in this one? You know, like all of this stuff. What if people, this is a big one. What if people don't like that this setting is way more European fantasy? Mm-hmm. The last book's setting was super fun and I like the world building in it almost better because there's so many fun cultures that I got to experiment with. And then we go to this one and it's like, we're in the Witcher, (laughs) you know, everything's like Sweden and Iceland and it's not as like fun. So I'm like, what if people hate that stuff? And then I just have to remind myself that these are the, these are the stories I wanted to tell and I wanted to read. And Mm -hmm. that's, what's most important to me. Absolutely. I mean, you're the author and it's your creative license, uh, to choose how you want to write it. And I think a lot of times people think they can develop their, the story in a better way or, oh, I would have done this or, oh, I would have done that at that part. But at the end of the day, putting as much time into this, I'm certain that you've already thought of so many different ways to end and to change and to manipulate different situations that this is the way that you wanted it and the way that you interpreted it. And I wouldn't, I, so this is me saying it <laughs> because you know, this is me. Uh, even if you hadn't thought of it, like if someone has a critique that's so like, I would have done it this way. Well then go write a fucking book. Right? Yeah. No, a hundred percent. I have that thought all the time, but yeah, I was literally <laughs> go write a fucking go book. do it yourself. You, you have the, the power and the ability um at the same time do you feel like you're open to critical feedback um yes yeah um i think that it depends because i recently had someone tell me that um there there are certain things where i'm like yes i agree and i've taken that into account a lot of the times it's stuff i already knew like someone about profit recently was like oh the writing style is inconsistent and I feel like have flip flops between the like, like flowery prose and this conversational stuff. And I'm like, that's so fair. I think I got a grip on that. So I, not that I need to dismiss this criticism, but I think it's valid, but I've already fixed it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the same person said, um, that they did not feel connected to Quincy until the end of the book because they felt like there was a lot of talk about what she wasn't and not about what she was. And I'm mm. like, well, that's really funny. Because in my opinion, that's kind of the point of her story um, is that like everyone is telling her what she needs to be, what she needs to be. And she doesn't even know 
where she stands because she isn't given a moment to think she's kind of just dragged everywhere she isn't given a chance to there's only one person constance who asks her like well do you want to be doing this Mm -hmm. and when she's asked that question she's like i don't know yet i haven't really had the chance so i think a lot of her actions speak more to her than like her actions and her behaviors speak more to the person of who she is than maybe the description or um the whether or not she wants to do things because i think that um actions always speak louder than words and like for anybody to know what the fuck they're doing at any given time with anything in the world Mm -hmm. and everything that's going on is really a big ask i feel well the thing is i i get it as a criticism as far as in like that she doesn't have a way to make actions and do things herself until the like later part of part two there's a moment where she finally makes a decision um and i think from that point on she really grows but up until that point i can understand being like she's just not doing anything (laughs) but like you know there have been some criticisms that i'm like absolutely 100 percent um i do need to fix or change that but um most of the time um i feel pretty secure in why i've made the decisions i've made as a writer so if someone's like why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that i feel like it's less of a getting defensive and more of a i did actually think of that Mm -hmm. so here's my explanation for why i didn't want to yeah no that makes sense and uh, like i think that it is awfully naive of people to think that uh you pro you haven't thought of a lot of these different ideas that they're probably proposing to you when they're like telling you how you should write your book and i don't get it a lot i think most of the time people will come to me because they Again, either didn't emotionally connect with with the character which with quincy i totally get um she's depressed and i know firsthand because i've read a character recently that i felt this way about if a character is in a dark place you is not impossible for the audience to kind of just find them annoying Mm -hmm. um i read a book called summer sons it's a southern gothic like romance and the main character is mourning his best friend's death and by the like first half of the book was over i'm like i can't stand this character i get that he's grieving it's definitely a me problem I cannot deal with it. Um, and it's, sometimes that's the fucking point, too. Yeah, exactly. No, like, I think it was really expertly done. I just was not in the mood to continue Dave, fighting with him. Mind, Dave picked a, this awful me, book. Oh, it's such a good called, book. Called uh, Portnery's <laughs> Complaint for this book club that we're in. Oh, and the so main good. character is just so... He's absolutely... He's neurotic. Neurotic and horrible. He's just awful. I, it just makes me angry and annoyed even just thinking about it right now. But it is like... That is the point of the book. Like right. this character yep. is supposed to be neurotic. He is supposed to be annoying. He is supposed to be all of these things it, that make you dislike him. It's the the book literally starts with a definition from a psychologist or a psychiatrist about his condition. Amazing. So like the book is written fucking perfectly. We've had so many arguments, we're not going to do it here. <laughs> but it's it's so agitating and it's like that is such good writing to mm-hmm. me because like that was his intention. That's the character. That That's was just his intention how they are. and yeah. he, he nailed it. Nobody that I've talked to they're like the writing's good but this book sucks and i'm like that's exactly the point it's not enjoyable it's not enjoyable. don't recommend. <laughs> you, you should read it. I might. <laughs> maybe, I might. I maybe recommend long. just for your own I, I can't even say it's enjoyable, but like for your own education. I feel that way about certain. I feel that I way feel like about that, the Babadook. That yeah. was a pain to watch, but you, gosh, was it good. You know, uh, a movie that I felt like that about was, uh, I can't remember it now. It has uh, had Leonardo DiCaprio in it and he gets mauled by a bear. Oh, The Is Revenant? That, the Revenant. Revenant yeah. yeah, absolutely miserable to walk, watch, but I was say it's Titanic. Uh, it's very it's very well done and it's very good and but it's absolutely miserable to watch and as i get older i feel like i can really appreciate that a lot more about certain stories that yeah. they're uh they're not supposed to be happy or joyful or, fun, or fun or any of those things it's supposed to be an experience and that's what they're offering you yeah it's a sad depressing shitty experience but it's still very impressive to portray that experience in such a profound way or, yeah or like i am legend or something mm-hmm. you know things like, with hopeless endings i think are very real <laughs> very i almost said fun and i was like well that's not the word for it but i enjoy something with like a real downer ending it can mm-hmm. it can really be 
good. a good time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some of my favorite stories are big time downer endings and everybody dies like Watchmen, one of my favorite movies, oh, yeah. Watchmen, graphic novels of all mm-hmm. time. And the ending is just... It's it's just, it sucks. A it gut sucks. punch. Yeah, it's Absolutely. like oh my god, everything's over, but it's all fixed for the better somehow. But you hate it at the mm-hmm. same time. Yeah, hundred <sighs> percent. You should go, everybody out there, look for the deleted scene in Titanic where Leonardo DiCaprio gets mauled by a bear. <laughs> <laughs> It's a traveling bear. Polar bear. Titanic. Yeah. It's, it's a polar, polar bear. bear. Polar bear on the Titanic. <laughs> that's actually what... He's on the iceberg. It's melting, that's so that's they... the last place oh, he can sh- hang out. Spoiler alert, that's how he gets ripped <laughs> off the, the yeah, door. Yeah, he could have been on the door. They, and James Cameron knew this, and that's why he added the polar bear. <laughs> right. <laughs> he took it out, you know, post, post-production, post but... Yeah. It was what, originally... But we all know it was there. If you do the physics of it, you can see the way he's getting pulled. <laughs> it could only be done by a polar, polar bear. Polar right. Bear. Yeah. They had to chop it out and cut... Mm-hmm. Crop out the polar bear behind yeah. him. Test audiences didn't react well to the polar bear. <laughs> no. It was a big time. There was, uh, you know, the Coca Cola ads back oh, then. Yeah, so pol- they, they everybody got really loved upset. polar bears yeah. at the time. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to see polar bear taking out Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh no. Well, Nina, this has been super fun. Yeah, thank you guys again for um, for taking up my offer on the on the advanced copies. And yeah, for, absolutely. For Thanks for coming back on for yeah. the second time. Woo. The producers, you're in a very limited club right now, so congratulations to you. uh, Congratulations to us for people wanting to come back on our show. That's cool, right? Fuck yeah. (laughs) We must be doing something right. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. I think so. I have a good time. Yeah. (laughs) Good. We have a good time, too. And uh, thanks again for coming on. Thanks to all the Patreon people, all the people who sponsored this show. Make sure you come to our huge event that we're throwing, September 16th, Everything at Once, One Year Palooza. It's going to be awesome. Johnny Evans is going to be there. Tyler Smile is going to be there. You're going to be there. I'm probably going to be there. (laughs) Yeah, a bunch of our guests are going to be there. So if you ever have questions or wanted to talk to them, that's going to be the place you're going to be able to find them, hopefully, because they'll all show up. And it's going to be great. Message us if you have any questions. That's right. And it's free, completely free. All the money that people donate for admission, if you donate for admission or donate for a pop or food, is going straight to buy items for clients at Gadenzia, a local inpatient substance abuse rehab. So uh, we are awful businessmen, and it's our loss and their gain. So let's help these folks out. Yes. Hell yeah. We love you guys. Peace.